Uh, now that it is past noon, I'm going to hand this off to the team of graduate student moderators, commenters, and the, the floor is yours for the camera. Thanks, Dan. Um, so before we get to the, uh, the speakers for today, um, Scott and Heather and I are going to summarize the talks from last week. Um, and uh, so I, um, I'm going to start off with uh, Heather Clifford's. Um, sh her talk was on the natural and human contributions to pre-monsoon snow and stream chemistry from the Kumba region of Nepal. Um, and Heather's research focused on um, the environmental risk in the Kumba Valley um, with a specific focus on whether increased human activity <clears throat> has had a negative impact on the local environment and water quality. Um, the overall goal of her expedition, of their expedition, was to understand the environmental changes in the Mount Everest region um, over time in the past, present, and future. Um, they collected samples and ran a number of chemical analyses um, on both snow and water samples and found that increased tourism and land use changes uh, might be a com contributing factor to the high values of anthropogenically sourced pollutants, uh, particularly, particularly lead that were detected in those samples. Um, and uh, with that, I will hand it off to Heather. So um, Inga also presented last time and her research um, investigated potential causes of the MODIS cold bias in the St. Elias range. She presented two hypotheses, the first being that the large spatial footprint of MODIS, uh, the MODIS sensor um, and highly heterogeneous alpine terrain generates an average reading that is potentially skewing what's actually happening on the ground. Um, and so to test this, she compared to Aster, another sensor on the satellite. Um, and then the second hypothesis posits that poorly constrained snow emissiv emissivity values um, are the culprit. Uh, and in testing this, they looked at patterns between modus measurements and in situ measurements. Uh, Inga's data set revealed, sorry, that uh, modus temperatures are much lower in situ. Um, and especially in fall and winter. And then aster temperatures were also much lower than in situ, uh, but not been by season. There wasn't enough data for that. Uh, discrep discrepancies also exist between emissivity data and in situ values, um, with the greatest temperature differences tend to be at low wind speeds and low levels of incoming solar radiation. All right, and I'm gonna to touch on Megan Spott's presentation. Um, so she traveled down to the Falcon Islands and collected a number of uh, lake cores to show shifts in the Southern Hemisphere westerlies over the past 23,000 years or so. Um, and the results showed varying conditions over these times, phases between wet and dry, cooler and warmer, um, and then different uh, wind patterns as well. Um, if we break this down in a little more detail, the LGM, uh, so about 23,000, 16,000 years ago, it was cold and windy, whereas the termination was warmer and windy. Um, then the late glacial period was cooler, drier, and windier until about 14,000 years. Um, and then the Holocene has had a lot of fluctuation between warm and wet. So it's really cool to see all these different changes that are going on in this small island location. Um, and this has big, bigger implications for how these westerly shifted um, and then the role those play in a much larger picture quaternary. Uh, change in glaciers. And if we look at an overall similarity between these presentations, um, we came up with um, that the three projects track changes in environments over time. Um, so whether that's through chemical analysis, or remote sensing techniques, um, but they stress the importance of using a range of proxies to tackle some of the bigger questions that we face today in climate sciences. Um, and even looking back at mechanisms driving changes in the past. Uh, and then I'd say a strong point of the Climate Change Institute that these studies highlight is the need for this in situ data um, and that how we all go out all over the world to collect this. Um, and this is important for complementing these remote uh, sensing techniques um, and they really stress the importance of this high quality spatial and temporal resolution. Um, yep, yeah, and I'll leave it at that for Ian to present the, this week's speakers. 
Great, thank you, Scott and Heather. Um, so first up today, uh, we have Anna Bright, who will be presenting on um, Beyond the Holarctic Comfort Zone, thermo Thermoregulation in a Sundulant rodent, rodent. So Anna. Thank you. <clears throat> so let me just try sharing my screen. And can you see a transition? Okay, awesome. So uh, I study mammalian thermoregulation or um, mammalian body temperature regulation. Uh, I work for Danielle Levesque and I'm part of the School of Biology and Ecology and the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine. So I'm going to give a brief overview um, of what we knew about thermoregulation, um, what we thought we had a pretty good handle on. Um, but recently we've been learning a lot more. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna go over in the second third of my talk. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what we will know um, after I hopefully get all my research done in this PhD. So um, we really started learning a lot about body temperature regulation in like the 1950s. And so I'm gonna talk about what we've learned since then. Um, and some of this is going to be I'm going to explain why it's wrong next. Um, so I think most people are familiar with the ectotherm versus endotherm um, thing, but just in case, um, these were, used to be called um, cold-blooded and warm-blooded animals. So on the left, you can see my mouse, right? Cool. Okay, so on the left, we have a pit viper that was hanging out by one of my tracks. Um, and it just stayed there for like three days because it didn't need to use a lot of energy to sit there. And it wasn't putting, it isn't able to use metabolic energy to create heat. Um, so that's something all of these cold blooded species have in common. However, um, cold blooded is misleading because if these animals are basking, so I did my work in Malaysia um, and their blood was warm, like relative to what a cold blooded animal um, would be in Maine, right? Um, so we say ectotherm are, are individuals that need external heat in order to change their body temperature uh, versus endotherms. Endotherms are able to use metabolic heat production. Um, so they use metabolism to fluctuate their body temperature. And this is, a, um, so this is my favorite street dog from Malaysia. Her name is Brown. Um, this is the monkey. Um, so birds and mammals are like the endotherms that we normally talk about, right? Um, and this is a cool thermal image in the middle. So that is actually a rattlesnake. Um, and as you can see, its temperature is ambient temperature. Um, it's not using any energy to maintain a body temperature. Whereas this mouse is very warm because it's able to use its own metabolism to um, raise its uh, body temperature. So yeah, this is a crocodile. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about thermoregulation just in mammals though. Um, so endothermy, that ability to make your own body temperature, your, your own body heat, um, evolved in mammals under warm and humid conditions. So right now we think that it evolved um, in the tropics and by having a body temperature that wasn't connected to ambient body temperature, it allowed mammals to expand their niche into the nocturnal niche. Um, so during the day, you have a whole bunch of different uh, microclimates and the range of ambient temperatures that you can find, um, if you're an ectotherm, if you want to be five degrees, if you want to be 25 degrees, whatever, you can find a spot. Um, when the sun sets, the range of amp available ambient temperatures is uh, much smaller. Um, so if you're able to have a body temperature that's just a couple degrees warmer, then you're able to have more time, more foraging opportunities. You have that entire niche to yourself, basically. Um, so that's where we think endothermy evolved. Yes. Okay, so um, endotherms can be um, homeothermic or heterothermic. So homeo means same, so that means constant body temperature. So over a range of ambient temperatures, um, homeotherms will have a constant body temperature. Um, that comes with a cost though. So at low body temperatures, they have to have a higher metabolic rate. I use my mouth instead of my hand. Sorry. Um, so at low ambient body or low ambient temperatures, they have to increase their metabolic rate in order to make heat to keep their body temperature stable. And you see the same thing at higher ambient temperatures also. So they use um, metabolism and some other techniques um, to maintain this constant 
excuse me, constant body temperature. Um, so other mechanisms they use are evaporative water loss. And you see that at warmer temperatures, so that's like panting and sweating. That's using evaporation to cool your body temperature back to that um, constant body temperature. Oh, sometimes it gets too hot and then you die at the end. Sorry, that's what that little slip is for. Um, and then you also have thermal conductance. Um, thermal conductance, it's easy to think of it as the inverse of insulation. So um, at warmer temperatures, you're gonna have less insulation. Um, this also encompasses uh, behavioral thermoregulation also. Um, so if you're splayed out like this, you're dissipating more heat to the environment versus if you're like in a ball or like you know, sticking your fingers in your armpits, um, you're reducing your surface area to volume ratio. Um, that's changing your thermal conductance. Um, and you have your wet thermal conductance, which takes into account water, and then your dry thermal conductance, which is independent of water. Um, so this is all for a homeothermic animal, and um, Mr. Skolander thought that that was great in 1950. Um, wonderful. If you're only looking at whole Arctic species that live in like Canada, the U.S., and Europe, then this works fantastically. Um, and you also have um, the lower limit of the thermal neutral zone and the upper limit of the thermal neutral zone are delimited by these changes in um, changes in evaporative water loss or metabolic rate. Um, it used to be that we just use metabolic rate. You have a lower inflection point and an upper inflection point. Within this thermal neutral zone, your metabolic rate within that thermal neutral zone is considered the, the basal metabolic rate. So that's um, the, the cost of just existing without the cost of maintaining a body temperature. So it was really nice to use this to compare all of the different Canadian wildlife, right? Um, but I'm going to explain why it's wrong. Um, so now, now that we are doing um, data collection outside of the whole Arctic zone, we're going to the tropics, we're going to South America, we're going to Africa, we're getting a lot more data on a lot more species, and we're finding a bunch of caveats to this. So not that it should be thrown away, um, but there are a lot of caveats. Um, so now I'm going to talk about heterothermy. So, um, this, so heterothermy and homeothermy exist, exist on a continuum. So we have homeotherms, like this beautiful dog here, her name is Luna, um, and so that she maintains like a relatively constant body temperature. Maybe when she sleeps, her body temperature drops a few degrees. The humans are homeotherms. Humans, it's so boring, like <laughs> do nothing interesting. Um, bats, on the other hand, um, fluctuate their body temperature. Um, so they, you know, hibernate for um, the winter, but they still wake up every few weeks um, during these interbout arousals. We don't 100% know why animals have to do these interbout arousals. Um, might be something with the pH in their blood or something like that. I don't know. It's not my job to find out either later. <laughs> um, and then just recently, um, we found, so we thought bats like hibernating mammals. Yeah, that's the very heterothermic. They fluctuate their body temperature a lot. And then we met Penrex. Um, Tenrex are endemic to um, Madagascar and they are just like freaks of nature, basically. Um, so we thought that you had to have interbot arousals during hibernation and these guys don't. They just like, they say screw it. And they, in Madagascar, they hibernate for like months at a time and they don't wake up and we don't really know why. Um, I'll talk about that on a different day though. Um, so yeah, so we know that heterothermy exists on a continuum. That's relatively um, like a new finding. Um, so then when you take heterothermy and you try to apply the Skolander Irving curve or this um, thermal profile to a heterothermic animal, um, sometimes they are homeothermic when they have young or when they're pregnant, lactating, then they do maintain a constant body temperature because it's beneficial to the young, it's a faster field growth rate, stuff like that. Um, but then you have other animals that are just like, no thanks, like not today, um, that's expensive and I don't feel like it. Um, so they just drop their body temperature and just let it track ambient temperature because it's cheap, right? Um, so when they drop their ambient body temperature, you also see changes in metabolic rate. We don't really know if metabolic rate drops, then body temperature drops, or if body temperature drops and then metabolic rate drops, still under discussion. Um, regardless, um, by just letting go of their body temperature, and again, there are many caveats to this, um, they change the metabolic rate, so they save energy there. Um, they save water. They don't need to um, have, um, they don't need to use like sweating and, um, and panting as much, so they save water because at this upper zone, um, 
their body temperature is tracking ambient temperature, but because um, it's still like an engine, right? It's still producing heat just by existing. You know, like if your car is idling, it's still producing heat um, because it's not a 100% efficient machine. Um, so it is still a couple degrees above ambient temperature. So it's naturally losing, losing heat to the environment. Um, so by having body temperature above what you would consider a normal thermic body temperature, they have that gradient and they use that gradient to dissipate heat to the environment. Um, so they don't need to use um, water loss. So this is really great if you live in a desert and you don't have that much water, then you just let your body temperature get hotter because then you don't have to use water to cool your body temperature down. Um, and you also see this affects thermal conductance. Um, and yeah, that's enough for today. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I studied um, body temperature regulation in a Sundaman, uh, Sundaland mirrored rodent. Um, Sundaland is the um, area around Borneo and Indonesia um, and Thailand. Um, yeah, it was awesome. Um, so Southeast Asia is a biodiversity hotspot, um, and it just has like insane amount of endemic species. Um, species that are found nowhere else on Earth are found here. So um, this is the island of Borneo. Um, Borneo is made up of um, part of Indonesia. Um, this is Sarawak, this is Malaysia, and then Brunei is right here. Um, and I was right here by the, um, maybe like an hour away from the South China Sea. Um, this is really interesting um, because it's not, um, it hasn't been separated from mainland for as long as Madagascar or anything like that. Um, it's a relatively shallow, shallow area here. Um, yeah, I don't normally talk about like, the history of like mammoths and stuff like you guys. So I didn't, I don't really care about this too much, um, but just so you guys know. Um, so the relative biodiversity of Anomalasia though is insane. Um, this is a really famous paper um, by Bergen et al. It was like, how many mammal species are there? And I've talked about it with so many different people. It's a really famous, really great paper. Um, and so what they did is they took, um, they found all the mammal species or whatever, probably not, but whatever. Um, and they looked at how many species there were in each region. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, this, so like, you know, Afrotropic has 1,500, whatever. Indomalaya has less, but then if you look at the actual area, it's 7.5 million square kilometers, um, which is cool. So then what they did is they looked at density, right? Which is the number of species divided by area, and then you get density. Um, and I would like to highlight Indomalaya. So you have 954 divided by seven is, 127, not 12.7. So they were off by a magnitude of 10, but because that's like, yeah, that's a, it kind of fits in the variance, whatever. Like it didn't really stand out until you realize you're off by a factor of 10 and you realize how diverse that area is. It's just incredible. So they, they realized their mistakes, they apologized, but um, yeah, just the fact that you didn't notice that mistake to begin with shows how awesomely biodiverse this area is. So anyways, um, my research question was, um, do tropical mammals have lower, more flexible upper limit, limits of their thermal neutral zone? Um, do they fluctuate their resting body temperature to a wider degree than temperate mammals because this is where endothermy evolves? Um, and at higher body temperatures, are, are tropical mammals more flexible in their body temperature, more thermally labile than temperate species? So keep in mind, we know a lot about temperate species and almost nothing about tropical species. So this is a rat that I studied. Um, they're cute. There's not too much special about them. They carry a lot of zoonotic diseases, um, a lot of diseases that humans can get. And I wasn't allowed to read about that until after I got back to the US. Um, and then I read it and it was scary, scary but whatever. That was before COVID also. Um, I also studied bats. That's great. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so they're nocturnal insectivorous rodents. Um, so they should be kind of like the original mammals and that they're insectivorous, um, but they are part of the rodent family, which isn't really known for extreme. Um, but as far as radis goes, they aren't known for like extreme heterothermia or anything. Um, again, this is their range, um, most of Southeast Asia and the Philippines. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so I track mammals in the um, rainforest near in the village where I was staying. I baited the traps with the pineapples or bananas, um, they are active at night. So then I would set the traps at night and go check on them in the morning. Um, and yep, I would weigh them and measure them and look for their reproductive status, male, female. Um, I also inserted an integrative transponder in their um, subcutaneous region behind between their 
shoulder blades, and that could tell me their body temperature, their subcutaneous temperature, and um, their unique ID, so I knew if I was recapturing individuals or not. Then I did respirometry, which is looking at um, changes in looking at how animals breathe, basically. Um, so I know what the incoming oxygen is 20.95, and then it should be less if the animal is breathing. Um, it's more if it's working hard to maintain a stable body temperature. It's less if it's, um, or the outcoming air is less percent oxygen if it's using a lot of energy. I also have carbon dioxide, 400 parts per million. When it's coming out, it should be higher. The higher it is, the more energy they're using, right? Um, and then finally, I could study uh, water vapor. So I got the, at the upper limits, I could look at their evaporative water log. Um, so this is a really simplistic view of that. Um, this is a, you put the animal in a box and then you put it in a temperature control unit, also known as a cooler, um, and then you can fluctuate the temperature there. Um, I, um, this is my super fancy cooler with a temperature control system. Um, it was very freaking hot there. So the coldest I could make my box was 22 degrees, um, which is accurate to what the animal would have been experiencing outside in the forest. Um, yeah, I also could um, track their body temperature constantly. I had a USB video camera so I could constantly monitor their activity and take them out if they were distressed or anything like that. Um, so I did find a lower um, break point. So across all these different ambient temperatures that I tested, I measured their, the velocity of oxygen consumption, which is just the proxy for metabolic rate. Um, and I did find a lower cutoff where it did increase below about 31 degrees. And I'm, I'm saying that's the thermal, the lower limit of the thermal neutral zone. Um, it's um, pretty standard. Um, but then, um, as far as the upper limit, you can't find an upper limit with the, up, with the um, velocity of oxygen consumption, with metabolic rate. It's just not there. And it's actually more common than not that you can't define the upper level, the upper limit of the thermal neutral zone with oxygen consumption. Um, however, with my subcutaneous temperature, um, so this is like my body temperature-ish, um, I did find a upper limit around 34 degrees or 35 degrees, excuse me. Um, the ratio of evaporative heat loss to metabolic heat production was also around 35. Evaporative water loss in milligrams per hour was also around 35. So I think you can clearly see that there is an upper limit, but not if you're just using metabolic rate to define it. Um, also with thermal conductance, you see a very similar trend. It's a little bit higher though. Um, yeah, so we found that Cinemus mulleri falls closer to the homeotherm end of the heterothermic homeothermic continuum. Um, that is probably just because of phylogenetic effects, because um, of who they're related to and their evolutionary history. Um, we did find an, a lower critical limit of the thermal neutral zone, but um, just by using metabolic rate alone, you can't definitively say an upper critical limit exists. Um, instead, um, using the metabolic rate and flexion points to delineate the upper limit, limits um, may not be a reliable method. So my next steps are to assemble a huge, massive freaking data set um, that contains all the critical temperatures for mammals to identify trends in the upper critical limits. Um, I started this also and found that um, at least since 2013, um, there were like 254 species that we had their lower critical limits of. Most of them were in the whole Arctic zone. Um, and then we had 93 upper limits quantified. So 93 species, do we actually know their upper limits? Um, that's, that's like nothing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I want to, and so we don't really know what's going on at that upper limit, the relationship between evaporative water loss, thermal conductance, um, or metabolism. Um, so that's definitely an area that needs to be um, studied more. Um, so yeah, a manuscript is being drafted, redefining the upper critical temperatures. And uh, with that, I would like to give a huge thank you to the people who kept me alive um, in the village. They were amazing. Um, Marcel here is now getting his master's studying um, insects. Um, basically, all the research that's going on there um, is just like naming all of these new species, um, which is really awesome opportunity that these people have. Um, so this is Marcel. He was amazing. Um, Aki studies lizards. Um, he also caught a lot of lizards and showed them to me, which was also a fun learning experience. Um, Gertrude just graduated with her civil engineering degree. Um, Lucia was my homestay, my auntie. She was amazing. This is my professor from UniMass. And this is Tal. She's a UMaine student who graduated and then was bored at home and literally just called me and said, can I come to Malaysia? And I said, yes, please. 
Um, so she's now studying meerkats in South Africa. So these are amazing humans. And this is Veronica. She took a picture of that pit viper because I did not get that close to it. Um, yeah, so that is all I have. Please ask me questions. Wonderful, thank you, Anna. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody have questions? I have a, I have a question actually. Um, so you mentioned the, there being sort of a, um, a, a bias towards the, the sort of um, northern hemisphere holarctic um, zone. Is that just because most of the most of the research was sort of Eurocentric um, or like Western Western research? Um, what was the reason for that? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so the universities that are conducting physi uh, physiological research just happen to be based in Europe and North America, at least until now. Um, now that since 2000, I would say, is when a lot of research started being taken, um, being conducted in um, like Southeast Asia and Madagascar and all that. But still very little has been done relative to the biodiversity. So It's also a lot more comfortable to do thermoregulatory research in Canada or the US. <laughs> yeah, they do. Anyone else uh, questions for Anna? I have a quick question. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, thank you. Uh, so should we conclude from this that our understanding of how climate change will impact various species is really not wouldn't say poorly understood, but certainly not as understood as we would like it to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there have been, that's my other data chapter. Um, there have been a lot of studies that are saying, okay, this is a thermal neutral zone. Pretty soon the temperatures will all be above animals thermal neutral zone. But we go outside of our thermal neutral zone all the time. It just means that we're not as physiologically effective. You know, maybe, um, you know, animals don't reproduce as much or can't forage as widely beyond these thermal neutral zones. But then, yeah, we have this extremely biased viewpoint um, just looking at, you know, homeotherms, all body, all animals must maintain a constant body temperature. And it wasn't until just a few years ago we were like, wait, hold up. So, yeah, absolutely. And the tropics are going to be changing temperatures uh, generally like less rapidly than the Arctic, than the poles, right? Um, the temperature will change less um, abruptly. But these animals are used to a range of temperatures that fluctuates by like, what, maybe 15 degrees um, versus, you know, in Canada, the bats that I study were like, oh, minus 40, okay, plus 40, no problem. So it's going to be a, a more drastic effect, but we can't definitively say what's going to happen because we don't know, we don't know the interaction at those upper limits yet. Super, okay. very important. Thank you. All right, um, let's move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Anna. Um, so this will be Abby Mann, um, and she's presenting Food for Thought, Insights into Pre-Colonial Canine Diets from the Maine Maritime Peninsula. Abby? Thanks, Ian. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, let me just get set up here really quick. And I think you can see my screen. Hold on. All right, can you all just see my presentation, not my notes? Okay, good. I'll start my clock. Um, I can see the notes, sorry. You can, okay. I'm still learning how to do this. Um, goodness gracious. Go to view options in advanced. Mm -hmm. And then portion of your screen. Um, hold on. Also, if you have two screens, um, <laughs> when you select which ones that you're sharing, if you share the one that has PowerPoint open on it, and then it'll give you notes on the other screen. And so okay. that you. Yeah. So when you, you can select which one's like outlined in green. All right, so let's try, how about that? Perfect. Okay. 
All good. Okay, great. So thanks for uh, having me. Um, so my name is Abby Mann. I am a third year graduate student in the anthropology department um, on my way out soon. Um, my talk today is called Food for Thought, Insights into Precolonial Canine Diets from the Maine Maritime Peninsula. Um, I'm advised by Dr. Bonnie Newsom of the anthropology department and uh, I will get right to it. So a quick outline of my talk today, I'll cover my research objectives and theoretical frameworks. I'll give you an introduction to the Holmes Point West site where I have based my case study and uh, the data collection that has gone into the project. Um, I'll cover the methodology and some stable isotope theory for everybody, um, my analytical approaches and the results discussion and next steps so far. Um, so for research objectives for this project, um, my aim was to understand human and canine relationships at the, hum at the Holmes Point West site, and in the hopes that this would uh, help to humanize the past since archeology span has a history of uh, placing artifacts or objects in the archeological record before people. Um, second, I wanted to contribute to the archeological data set for the Northeast specifically and North America more broadly using Holmes Point West as a case study. Um, and then third, I wanted to add to the cultural heritage of Wabanaki people in Maine, supporting early education and outreach about cultural heritage management. Um, so the theoretical frameworks that I utilized for this project, um, there are two main arms to this. The first is agency theory. Um, so using that to uh, take a look at what canine roles were in human societies in the past. Um, and I think it can help us to uh, pinpoint choices that um, people made um, about the things that uh, they did with their dogs and their health and their diet. Um, and this would lead to an understanding of human agency as well as uh, more information about dogs because dogs are interesting in and of themselves. Um, and this uh, project also incorporates an indigenous archeologies approach. Uh, so there is a deep history of collaboration at this site. Um, and it includes uh, entities such as the Passamaquoddy tribe, Maine Coast Heritage Trust and landowners of the site uh, on which we work. Um, and this type of uh, collaborative project encourages multivocality in archeology. span um, by involving these different communities. Um, and that can offer us a bridge between empirical and community oriented archeologies, um, hoping, hoping to balance the tension that it exists uh, often between indigenous communities and archeological research interests. So in order to address these archeological questions, um, I utilized a case study uh, from the main maritime peninsula where we are located. Um, this site, Holmes Point West, is located in Machias Bay. It's adjacent to many other important archaeological sites in the region, um, including the Picture Rock site, which is across the bay. Um, and that has the oldest assemblage of pictographs on the east coast of North America. They date back approximately 3,000 years until the present um, day when uh, we have Europeans visiting shores. Um, the site spans the um, ceramic period. Uh, the oldest dates we have are right around 3000 years before present. Um, and the site has, um, uh, there, there are, is a presence that's been detected of uh, European um, components to the site. So both French and English. Um, so data collection at the site started in 1973. Um, I wish I could give you a, a more uh, kind of deep or broad understanding of the site and how complex it is, but I don't have enough time today. Um, so I'll just give you a brief overview. Uh, so 1973 excavations were led by University of Maine researcher Robert McKay. Uh, they took a field school down there and they excavated. Um, the excavation strategies utilized in 1973 were a trench style. So two by two meters um, was the regular unit size. And um, as you can imagine, this led to um, some difficulties in pinpointing a lot of the contextual relationships that exist. So that's one of the things that we try to preserve as archaeologists, because um, it helps us to interpret the record. Um, so there are challenges with a lot of the um, legacy data that come from this site uh, due to the original excavation strategies. Um, Dr. Brian Robinson, who 
we have unfortunately lost. Um, he went back to the site in 2008 and he revisited a lot of the sites that had been um, originally visited by researchers back in the 60s and 70s. And he found Holmes Point and opened the site up even further. Um, and that work has been continued until uh, starting last year until um, and moving forward by Dr. Bonnie Newsom, my advisor. And um, just to go back really quickly. So my point in making, uh, the point I'm trying to make with the way that methodology um, of excavation happened in the past is that our, our excavation strategies have really um, come a long way since then. And uh, we are typically um, excavating one by one meter units and those are divided into uh, uh, quads. And so our uh, typical provenience unit is um, down to uh, five centimeter depth and within one quad um, of each uh, unit. So we have a, a lot more control over our spatial relationships and, and cultural zones. So this is a, just a quick grid of the site. Uh, the pink um, areas that you see are the original excavations from 1973, uh, those block excavations. Um, and then the light green, you see like Easter egg color. Um, those are the 2008 through 2014 uh, excavations by Dr. Brian Robinson. And then most recently we have that teal colored um, set of boxes in the top left, and those are from the most recent field school in 2019. Um, so originally during 1973, there were some dog burials that were excavated. So it's a minimum of four uh, canine individuals, and they were identified just as a bone cluster uh, at the time due to the, the sort of coarse excavation techniques used. Um, so a student had noted them in their field journal here, and uh, this is the most uh, contextual information that I have about the dog burials <laughs> that are at the site. Um, so one of them is identified in this sketch. There was a, uh, another individual adjacent to it and they were oriented in mirror image. Um, and, uh, and they're at um, a depth of about 30 centimeters below the surface. Um, so in order to uh, get at the you know, our re my research objectives of, of understanding human and canine relationships at the site, um, I have some different analytical approaches that I use. Um, so one of them is utilizing legacy collections from 1973 uh, instead of utilizing new uh, data. Um, this is, uh, I think, an important uh, role that archaeology is playing uh, nowadays. Um, we have boxes of stuff laying around. We need to uh, look at it and learn what we can. Um, and then my main uh, analytical um, method that I use to get at the information I want is I um, started to uh, think about how to use what is called canine surrogacy approach um, as an analogy to get at human diet. So this is um, a method in which you use dogs as an analogy for human diet. Um, and it has been, uh, tried and, and true. And, and so researchers have shown that dietary information that is gleaned from isotope ratios of carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 uh, derived from bone collagen can reflect a lifetime protein intake of an individual. Um, and this also addresses some practical and ethical considerations. There are often a lack of human remains to work with at sites. And then we are uh, very conscious of um, NAGPRA uh, laws, which um, they uh, dictate how we uh, go about repatriation of human remains to communities, um, indigenous communities, and uh, consider things like um, lineal descent and cultural affiliation. So looking for other ways to get information that are not through human remains. Um, and then uh, my third approach is using an isotopic baseline. Um, so this would provide regionally comparative data to assess dietary variability. Um, so some basics about canine surrogacy approach. Um, the categorical framework for this was laid out by Guerry in 2012. Um, it assumes two, uh, here, hold on one second. It assumes two fundamental a priori assumptions, um, which you use to specify the way that dogs share uh, similar isotope signatures with humans. And one is that dogs had access to human foods through scavenging, handouts, or you know other types of uh, food sharing, and that 
Secondly, dogs and humans metabolize and incorporate food in a similar way so that you would see the same isotopic fractionation incorporation into the respective uh, tissue. Um, so granting these assumptions, uh, there's three categories of factors that might influence the isotope um, signatures of uh, diet um, or uh, of dog diet, uh, which re might reflect human diet. And that's uh, first inherent biological or behavioral differences that exist between them that would show up in the tissues, cultural factors, which affect human and dog relationships, um, which might contribute to disproportionate isotopic signatures that would differ from humans. And then finally, environmental um, stimuli that might affect how humans cared or fed their dogs. Um, hold on, what am I doing? Okay, and so then some, um, a few more basics about stable isotope theory. Um, they uh, reflect relative plant proportions with C3 and C4 uh, photosynthetic pathways. Um, and it can be used to distinguish um, contributions of maize to diet. So that's through uh, the delta of um, carbon-13. And then um, uh, nitrogen isotope ratios show a stepwise increase between three and five parts per mil uh, with each trophic level. So they can be used to differentiate between herbivorous, omnivorous, and carnivorous diets more or less. Um, and then due to longer food chains in marine ecosystems, you see um, marine diets can be uh, differentiated from terrestrial focused diets. Um, and then this is just a, a graph um, from Tycott uh, 2004, just to show you uh, where the distribution of marine or of uh, carbon and nitrogen isotope ratios will fall when plotted against each other. Um, so I, I have a sampling methodology which uh, incorporated five individual dogs, um, and these were done by a minimum number of individuals to avoid resampling of individual canines. Um, and then an additional, um, yeah, so three were individuals who were separated by MNI, and then the final two samples were taken in different cultural contexts to avoid resampling. Um, and these followed standard bone collagen extraction and calibration methods, which were completed at Trent University and Beta Analytic. Um, the same uh, was true for the, the baseline sample, the environmental sample used to, um, or created to assess dietary variab variability. Um, and 43 samples were taken. Um, and these were also uh, followed the same standards of calibration and extraction. And those were done at Trent University. Um, and I'd like to note that all of the, um, the work that I did um, with the remains, I received uh, permission from the Passamaquoddy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer um, prior to doing this work in, uh, in conjunction with the collaborative effort that we have working at this site. So uh, my results for the isotopic baseline, um, what they show is that dogs um, have a really wide uh, variability of diet and they are shown um, in gray and they're in the middle of this graph. Um, and so the standard deviations are uh, greater for dogs than they are for any other types of species shown here. And so you can see green depict terrestrial animals with terrestrial diets. Um, blue are generally marine fish and mammals. Um, we have some aves depicted in red here and they show a, a little more variability um, due to where their food sources come from. And then we have some riverine uh, influence species on the left upper side, um, which are snapping turtle and, uh, and river otter. So those show different carbon um, fractionation than the rest. And so in order to think about how the, what the explanations might be for why dogs had such a variable diet, um, I looked at, uh, uh, car radiocarbon dates for each one. Um, so the five individual dogs, they were all radiocarbon dated. And when you plot the dates on top of the um, isotopic variability, so when you look at them on this chart, it starts to look like there's a little bit of a, a temporal trend going on. Um, so we have the oldest date showing a marine signature. And then as you get younger, so this is about a thousand years in the past before present. And then as you get down to the most recent, which is right around European contact, you have um, a very terrestrial signal. 
And when you compare this data to other regional data from similar sites, um, you can see the pattern, con it, it continues to stand out. So uh, marine variability, or excuse me, marine diet is consistent for all species or for all um, dogs that have been sampled that are published in the literature. And then I have one unpublished um, sample. Uh, so uh, just leading into our discussion, uh, the baseline provides support for variability in canine diet. Um, it looks like marine signatures are um, showing up in dog diets prior to about 700 years before present. Um, so there are different possibilities for the factors that might play into why that, uh, that diet changes as we get closer to the present in time. Um, there's a possibility that uh, canine individuals from the site were influenced by available resources. Um, and choices made by human communities. And then for an archeological uh, crowd or from that perspective, um, talking about taphonomic and zooarchaeological factors, um, previous work that's been done at the site confirms what, um, what is showing up here in the diet um, dietary analysis. Um, the site has uh, shown ritual patterns of butchering and disposal of both seal species and uh, sea mink, which is extinct now. Um, and so it's important to consider in the context of Holmes Point West, uh, the dogs uh, that we're seeing here and, and that their diet is varied. Um, and the presence of dogs at the site is also combined with a low in inc incidence of um, chewing behavior, which may indicate that there is specialized treatment of seal remains. So perhaps, you know, it, it's possible that, that uh, dogs at the site were not allowed to eat a lot of the marine material that was available. Um, and just moving forward, uh, future work and recommendations for this work, uh, for this research. Um, genetics would really shine a lot of light on, um, on these questions, um, maybe local versus visiting dogs. Uh, you could be seeing terrestrial diets um, from dogs that are not from the coastline there. Um, they're including stable uh, sulfur isotopes as a third measure of dietary variability could shine some light on other dietary inputs. Um, stable uh, isotope uh, sulfur, uh, st stable isotopes of sulfur 34 um, can be used to distinguish between freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems. So we could maybe identify um, those inputs to canine diet. Um, and then I'd like to just acknowledge the collaboration that has happened. Um, and th so this, uh, this is an important part of the work we do at the site with the tribe and the Maine Coast Heritage Trust who manages the property. Um, and then finally, um, I'd like to just acknowledge um, all the people and the, the um, groups that have made it possible for me to do my research. Um, thank my advisor for all her patience and the rest of my committee members, Eric Query and Dan Sanwise for all their support. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Um, in the interest of time, I think we should uh, move on. So if you have questions for Abby, I encourage you to contact her directly. Um, so next up, we have Alessandro Marighetti, and he will be presenting on exploring past and present um, Beringia to, under to understand uh, the Mammoth Step. Alessandro? Hello, everyone. I'll share my screen now, but Abby, you have to sh stop sharing yours. Oh, I know. I'm trying. I'm bad at this stuff. Uh, what am I doing? There should be a stop sharing option on the top, like oh, a red button. It's on the other side. Thanks. <laughs> so now it's my turn to not do it right. Okay. Okay. Is anyone able to see my notes or is this correct? Perfect, thank you very much. So we don't have a lot of time, so I'll try to go as quick as possible. Hi everyone, I'm Alessandro Maraghetti. I'm a third year PhD student in Jacqueline Gill's lab. I work on paleoecology, and today I want to present you the like an overview of the field work that happened last year. That saw me going to Siberia to try to explore the past and present of Beringia to understand the mammoth step. And I would like to thank him. Thanks in advance, Dr. Karen James, for all the pictures that you will see during this presentation. Okay, so, <clears throat> oh, and the translator, translator Nadia Noeva, that is 
this person, if you can see my mouse, because without her, we wouldn't have been able to do much. Okay, so I mentioned the mammoth step and this ecosystem take the names from the woolly mammoth and uh, the mammoth step was a biome that uh, takes the name from the animals that were roaming it and it was a widespread biome during the last glacial period. We think based, based on faunal remain and pollen remain that this biome was uh, spanning from uh, basically Spain to Maine because they found some evidence of mammoth tusks in the Penosco, Penobscot River. I wasn't expecting that, of course, on the exposed shelf and not over the ice. Uh, fossil evidence also suggests that it was a highly productive ecosystem and it was brimming with cold adapted animals like mammoths, rhino. Uh, you can see a lot of artistic depictions of it that are very probably exaggerated because you will never see all these animals in the same place. But still, the faunal remains suggest that it was like, a, it's been called the Serengeti of the North because there was a very diverse uh, assemblage of animals and a, apparently a very productive vegetation that sustained those animals. And this is kind of unexpected because we know that today the Arctic is very unproductive and doesn't harbor that diversity. Uh, the region I'm going to focus on uh, for my research and in this presentation is Beringia. And Beringia is defined as the, the stretch of land from the Lena River in Siberia that you can see pretty much here to the Mackenzie River in Alaska that is pretty much here. So. Uh, the last time the Beringia was completely emerged, because Beringia is right now, most of it is below sea water, uh, was uh, it emerged for the last time 70,000 years before present, and it's, it went below the water at the onset of the Holocene 11,500 years before present. Uh, we refer to Beringia often as the land bridge, but this was much more than just a land bridge, because as you can see from this really cool reconstruction, of his bathymetry during the last glacial maximum, there was a lot of land that was exposed. It was not only between Alaska and Siberia, but it was also north of Siberia. And people fishing there still find uh, mammoth tusks and mammoth bones coming up on the fishing nets when they dwell in those areas. This region is a really, it's really interesting for many reasons. There's a rich paleopological record, it's a land bridge. So a lot of migration was going on on both sides, including humans. and even if things are changing a little bit, it's still regarded as probably a place where the first uh, humans arrived to the to North America, testing the land bridge when it was emerged. So the, uh, around the Pleistocene Holocene transition, the mammoth step that we can see in another very beautiful rendition uh, here uh, disappeared along with its dwellers. So most of the animal uh, got extinct, population collapsed, some of them survived, but in, uh, in smaller populations. Uh, so the dry, diverse, productive grassland that we can see in the renditions kind of left space for what we see today in the Arctic, that is a wet, shrub-dominated tundra that is not very productive, uh, on the contrary of what we know of the mammoth steppe. The traditional interpretation for these events is that the warmer and moisture climate of the Holocene promoted the paludification of the Arctic, driving mega herbivore to extinction because of lack of forage and habitat. But we really don't know what these animals were eating on that environment, and we don't know how they were interacting with that environment. Uh, and there is another interpretation of this uh, shift between the steppe tundra of the Pleistocene to the mesic tundra of the Holocene, that is, that this ecosystem was actually driven by the megafauna activities. And the proponents of this uh, ecosystem-based theory uh, suggest that based on modern studies, we know that animals often change the vegetation structure and composition of the ecosystems in, where, in which they dwell, and they're able to change nutrient cycling. And in places like the Arctic, where nutrients like uh, phosphorus and nitrogen are very limiting, uh, an increased turnover of nutrients can really promote a different ecosystem, uh, a different vegetation. They also change fire regimes by changing the amount of biomass and promote, promoting different kinds of species. So these in the Arctic will have meant the promotion of more productive species, for example, forbs instead of, instead of, instead of sedges, and the prevention of shrub encroachment, so a decrease in uh, woody plants that we see in today's tundra, and this will all lead to an increase in productivity and incre increased perspiration rates of the soil, 
that will prevent water logging, and this would have led to an increased formation of permafrost. So the proponents of this thesis uh, also argue that if today's mega if the megafauna of the Arctic was present today, the permafrost, the, the collapse of permafrost and the melting of permafrost that we observe will not be as devastating because the action of the animals on the landscape would kind of buffer the effect of climate change. And following this hypothesis, the proponents of this idea uh, started a megafaunal uh, experiment by reintroducing large herbivores in a reserve named Pleistocene Park to test if the animals were actually able to trigger uh, the to, to trigger the kick, to kickstart the step like ecosystem of the mammoth step. But we will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, so since we don't really know how the species of the mammal steppe were interacting between each other, it's very difficult to test this hypothesis. So during 2019, in the summer, uh, the Climate Change Institute organized an expedition to Yakutsk in Yakutia, in the Bering Beringia region, with the goal of building the relationship with local institution for present and future collaboration, because Russia is not easy to work with, and Yakutia, it's in the far east of Russia, and it's very uh, isolated also in Russian, in Russia. So building some work relation, relationship with that is very important. Uh, the second uh, reason was to collect paleontological samples that will allow us to reconstruct the interaction between animals and plants in the past, and also to scout Pleistocene Park, the place I mentioned earlier, to see if there's the potential for studying the vegetation and how it's affected by the animals that they're introduced there, because there's not a lot of other places where you can do that. So the first step of the expedition was to go to Yakutsk, that's the capital of the region of uh, Yakutia. It's a, a place uh, that is, uh, it's, it's an interesting mix of Eastern and Western culture. Uh, it's in the zone of external, st extra zonal step. So the vegetation you can see here, uh, it's uh, very influenced by local morphology and there's a mixture of uh, step and uh, taiga. It's an important place because it's the central hub for all the findings of uh, Pleistocene animals and carcasses that are, uh, that happens in Siberia. So every time you hear about something, some incredible mummy found in the permafrost, the end place where it's stocked, it's there and more precisely one of these drawers. And there's, I don't know, many hundreds there. So it's an incredible place for research, research on Pleistocene megafauna. And there we connected with Dr. Albert Kotopopov and Dr. Valery Plotnikov, that are the, in charge of the problems related to the mammoth fauna in the Academy of Science of the Republic of Saka. There, with their help, we visited the Academy archives and collected some material. We can see here some of the stuff I'm going to talk about more later. And they showed us the work they're doing, including finding tools used uh, from this is the first time they found a Northern Siberian carving tool to extract meat from uh, mammoths. They showed us the vegetation around and helped us collect reference material for the future studies we are going to do with them. And they showed us their collection, including, uh, this is it's a really bad picture of a perfectly preserved mammoth uh, up. I don't know the English word, a calf, I think. And uh, we looked into their collection to see if there was some trace of direct interaction between animals. So this is a piece of grass that was found stuck between the teeth of a bison. And we also prepared for the expedition to uh, that were to happen in a couple of days to Belaya Gora on the Tigurka River. So this is one of the great Siberian river. And we were, uh, this is a terrible map, but we were far east, far eastern and far northern than Siberia. So that place is very re relevant because in the last few years, the uh, locals find an incredible amount of fossil. Uh, for example, this is the head of a Pleistocene wolf that was found, I think, three years ago in that location. And these are pictures of two lion, cave lion pups also found a couple of years ago. And uh, these findings are possible because of the activity of the locals. Uh, there are, the people refer to them as Mostrup or Tusk Hunter. Uh, they are local people with very different backgrounds that in the summer go there, go to look for uh, fossils on the riverbanks or to dig holes in the or uh, actual caves in the ground to find for uh, mo mostly mammoth tusks and hooli rhino horns because they are a really good way to make a lot of money as they are the only legal source of uh, ivory and uh, traditional medicines for the Chinese market because existing animals are in danger, endangered animals cannot be legally used, but mammoths and woolly rhinos are extinct. 
so no one cares if they can if, if that algorithm gets sell, gets sold and they recently accepted to work with the academy of science uh, so they can boost the local economy with researchers coming to look to their funding and also sell the interesting specimen that are not of interest for their market now in our case luckily we were not interested in anything expensive because the main goal of our expedition there was to find the proof of direct interaction between animals and plants in this case coprolites and gut content coprolites are fossil dung and in that region so usually what is found is in cave very dry in that region given the amount the permafrost allow for preservation of frozen coprolites that means that the organic they are still rich in organic material and they are very well preserved uh, so what we did was to go into the man-made caves that they dig with hoses and look for specimen we got other interesting finding that I'm not going to talk about here because we are already out of time. Uh, the samples were stored individually in the caves to keep them frozen because the idea is to work on uh, uh, to try to extract most information possible from them. So using ancient DNA, pollen analysis and macrofossil analysis, we want to be sure that the preservation is the best possible. And in the picture here, you can see we found an entire bison the the skull was the only part that wasn't preserved you can see some skin and muscle tissue here and that's his gut literally his stomach so there's and they found these things constantly so this is a really good place to do any kind of research that involve uh, places in arctic megafauna once back in Yakuts, we didn't have a lot of time and uh, we had to 3d scan all the corporates we found because the subsampling we were going to perform would have been very destructive uh, the resources of the Academy of Saha is not excellent, so we had to improvise some uh, sterile lab, uh, more or less, using like grocery produce, uh, and that's why they're really happy to collaborate to work with us. And then we followed some protocols to be sure to, for, to minimize the contamination of the samples that ended up being a lot. So there collection that I subsampled was of 36 corpolites, and we find there are other 25 for a total of, oh, this is wrong, but like, they're not 52, that's all data, that they ended up being more, but the important thing is that more than 55 corpolites are now stored in the humane fridge and Sawyer, and we can't wait to look for what's inside them. Uh, we will be able to test how herbivores were interacting with the vegetation with an unprecedented taxonomic and, and uh, spatial resolution. And this can potentially help us to address questions on the niche partitioning of the herbivore gill of the mammoth step to understand, well, to, to have a better idea of uh, uh, the reason behind the extinction of the animals or the disappearance of the environment. The third and last step of the expedition was to Chersky uh, to visit Pleistocene Park. So again, we went there to build a relationship with the local institutional researchers. In this case, the Zim of father and son, the people who promoted the ecosystem, eco uh, ecosystem hypothesis for the mammoth step and to scout Pleistocene Park for possible places where to do experiments on modern vegetation and megafauna interactions. The park is an interesting place. Uh, it's not very big. It's uh, it's basically based on an enclosure of 20 kilometer square uh, with a smaller inner fence where the actually most of the animals are. The experiment started in 1996, uh, but the biggest input of animals arrived after 2006. So what I'm going to refer to is mostly this place and. Uh, their idea is to kickstart the ecosystem processes that allowed the mammoth step to exist in their idea. Uh, unfortunately, there is not a lot of information on the vegetation there, and that was clear after talking with them. They are very interested in understanding the effect of herbivore and permafrost that is proven, and they published that inside the park, you can actually see a much uh, a formation of permafrost and not depletion of permafrost, despite uh, climate change and what they see is a change in the structural composition in the structure of the vegetation but they don't have any data of prior vegetation or they don't have any information of the floor of the park at the moment so they're really happy to work with us to try to figure out if the effect of our rivers is mediated by the changes of the vegetation and you can see in this picture the southern part is inside the park and the northern part is the outside of the park this is a drone picture that we took during the field expedition. There is something going on and we look forward to understand what and how this is happening. And for the future plans for this, if it's going to be possible 
to do it, of course, next year, is to get there to uh, identify suitable location for vegetation studies. We will start with uh, an actual survey of the vegetation of the park and outside the park uh, with the hope to start soon a long-term exposure study with the manipulation of nutrients uh, and uh, other types of uh, um, of study that will allow to understand the effect of herbivores and the effect of the removal of herbivores. And that will allow us to understand if the extinction of megafauna can have affected the vegetation of the Arctic. And uh, this field work, hopefully when it will start, will be funded uh, thanks to the Churchill Award for Outstanding Exploration. So I'm really, I'll be happy to talk about this in the next Brown Symposium, hopefully. And thank you for listening and I'll take any question. Wonderful, thank you, Alessandra. Uh, let's, if we have one question, let's take one question for Alessandro and, uh, and then we'll adjourn. It's not a question, but before we adjourn, I do have some very brief comments on each of the papers, so. Well, if there are no questions, let me you know, just wrap up today's session. First, remind you that we meet again next week on the 26th. The schedule's posted uh, and everybody knows their assignments. So just to comment quickly, quickly on the three papers, Anna Bright highlighted the hot button topic of the insufficient acceptance of diversity and inclusivity in our understanding of thermoregulation in mammals. And Anna is addressing this gnawing problem through field studies of a Sunderland rat. Abby Mann has sunk her teeth into the issue of canine human relations at the Holmes Point West site in Machias. We may think that life is dog eat dog, but with the canine surrogacy approach, Abby actually relies on the idea that it was a dog-eat-people-food world to get data on subsistence that are otherwise unavailable. And her data suggests the change through time away from a maritime dog diet, which may not be as fishy as it sounds. <laughs> Finally, Alessandro is working, is working on taking a mammoth step forward and understanding a widespread biome of the LGM with a focus on Beringia. He asks mega questions about feedbacks between animals, vegetation, and climate. And to help address these questions, Alessandro recently recovered some really cool shit. And I look forward to hearing the scoop and the analysis of this poop at the next Borns. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Oh, that's fine.